Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Singer. I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator for the Kellogg Hubbard Library. We're really happy to be partnered once again with the League of Women Voters. This is the seventh speaker series that the League has done and that the library has hosted. And we're really happy to have so many people here tonight and to have such great panelists. I'm going to give a couple of housekeeping items. The first one is to please keep yourself muted uh, so that we don't have any interference with the discussion. Um, I am recording this conversation and this panel, and it will be picked up by Orca, hopefully. So if um, if you know somebody who really wanted to be here but couldn't, you can send them to the Kellogg Hubbard Library's YouTube page or to Orca's YouTube page, and you can find the video there. It'll, it'll take a little bit of time after we're done, but it'll show up there. Um, you... Uh, we hope that you put questions that come to you as you, you are listening to the discussion in the chat. Uh, we will also open up for some discussion afterwards. I'm still letting people roll in. Um, and when you do that, it's probably helpful to use the raise hand button. Um, if you don't know how to do that, at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. And when you hit that, you can raise your hand. And that lets us know that you want to you wanna jump in and say something. And we'll do that at the very end. Um, again, this is the League of Women Voters speaker series. This is the climate change speaker series. Uh, we have a few more talks coming up. It, there's going to be the impacts of climate change on agriculture and ecology, which will be on December 14th. Climate change and social justice will be on January 11th. Uh, current legislative initiatives update will be on February 8th. And what can we do will be on March 8th. So all of those are on Zoom, they're at 7 p.m. You can register for any of those on the Kellogg Hubbard Library's website on the adult programs page. I will put the link in the chat and we hope to see many of you um, for those programs as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Peter Walk, Managing Director of Efficiency Vermont and he's going to introduce our panelists tonight. Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you tonight. My name is Peter Walk, I'm a Montpelier resident and. Um, as Michelle said, the Managing Director of Efficiency Vermont uh, and had in previous roles have had the opportunity to work with your panelists on a number of issues across uh, state government and import to climate change activities. And so really excited for you to hear from them because you're really blessed with some incredible panelists tonight. So without further ado, let me introduce them. Uh, Dr. Leslie Ann debigny Juru is the state climatologist and a professor of geography at the University of Vermont. She has served in both of those roles since 1997. Um, and while being a past president of the American Association of State Climatologists, she also is a key lead author for parts of the National Climate Assessment, including the section in the, on the Northeast. So we are really fortunate to have Dr. Dibidin Giroux with us tonight, and I'm uh, grateful for that. Julie Moore is the Secretary of Natural Resources. Um, I had a, a mock bio for her um, that was something about being my friend and uh, former boss, but uh, she, we'll give you the serious one anyways. Um, ANR is the state agency with primary responsibility for protecting and sustaining Vermont's environment, natural resources, wildlife, and forests, and for maintaining Vermont's beloved state parks. Uh, Julie was named to that position by Governor Phil Scott in January of 2017. And as ANR Secretary, um, Julie is responsible for shaping Vermont's environmental agenda. Uh, she specifically focused on water quality issues, Vermont's forest economy, and the importance of conservation. Uh, she currently serves a key role and is sort of uh, the chair's right hand on the Vermont Climate Council um, and on the board of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board Council on Rural Development, and as well as the Echo uh, Lake Aquarium and Science Center. So Julie, thank you for being here. Uh, we are also fortunate to have Jared Ulmer uh, with us. Jared Ulmer has managed the Climate and Health Program at the Vermont Department of Health since 2015. In his role, he collaborates with state, local, and non-governmental partners to increase preparedness for climate-related health impacts in Vermont. He also works to promote health improvement through appropriate climate change mitigation strategies. Previously, Jared worked for 10 plus years in private and academic se sectors to support healthy community design through transportation and land use planning, tool development, and community guidance. Um, so we're really fortunate to have a, a, a great panel here today. We're gonna start with a, a 
few minutes uh, each for each of our panelists to introduce um, themselves and the topic at hand, and then we'll go to some questions, and then we'll go to your questions at the end. Uh, so, Leslie Ann, would you begin for us, please? Thanks, Peter. Is everybody hearing me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Because each time you do this on Zoom, it's just a little bit different here. All right. Thank you so much to the Vermont League of, of Women Voters for having us here. Um, uh, as Peter said, I'm a professor in the, at the University of Vermont, and I absolutely love um, going about and learning more about what climate change means to everybody across the state of Vermont. And so um, thinking about that and thinking about all of the various things that we know about um, weather, climate and climate change in Vermont, one of the things I always like to, to make sure I leave um, everyone with is the understanding of, of climate change as an entire system. It's not just one piece, but it's all of these pieces that are interrelated. And so um, if we think about all of the things that we know about our changing climate here in state and the work that we're doing around mitigating greenhouse gases, but also thinking about our natural and working lands, our ecosystems, and how those are critically important, both in terms of mitigation, but also adaptation, and the ways in which all of the, the things that we put into the atmosphere not only warm the atmosphere, but they, but they also change the the, the air that we breathe. And so that's where a lot of the human dimensions of our changing climate come into play. And so both of these diagrams here are, are parallel and similar to each other because they help us to think about not just temperatures rising, not just increases in, in rainfall or snowfall, but also things like changes in our soils drying out, our, our wind patterns changing, are we getting more snowstorms and all of those other things that are also part of our understanding of how uh, climate is changing across the state. And so what's missing from all of these diagrams are the people and the people both in terms of influencing and impacting our climate, but also being influenced by and, and impacted on by the climate itself. And so, um, Sometimes it's easier or better to think of, of, of climate change in terms of sectors. So what's happening in the agriculture sector? What's happening in health? What's happening in, in our energy sector? What's happening in transportation? What are residents along the coast facing? And that might, makes it a little bit uh, more concrete in, in looking at how these changes are sort of happening over time. So the, the the sort of thinking about this and, and thinking of it in a larger context, we all live in a society, we all live in, in various forms or levels of, of government and governance. And so all of the things that we're trying to do to address climate change are not being done in isolation. So for my few minutes, I'm just going to um, enter or leave this, this diagram here, which I created um, as part of writing the Climate Action Plan, which was my attempt to, to sort of put in my head how all of these multiple moving pieces are playing out. And so thinking about all of the things that we're seeing with more and more heat waves, thinking about our growing seasons getting longer, thinking about um, having more days above 87 degrees as, as part of that core of, of how climate is changing across the state, but also honoring and lifting up um, all of the equity lenses that we um, should and could bring to, to this understanding and knowledge, honoring our Abenaki traditions, um, looking at the ways in which uh, climate change um, policies fit in at not just the local level, but also through the county level, the RPC level, all the way up to the state level. And then trying to be really, really proactive and thinking about, hey, where should we actually invest a lot of resources and where should we not? And then what do we know? What do we not know? And then how do we use that to help us all move together um, as a society? So those are my few um, introductory remarks and I'd love to turn it back over to, to Peter. Thank you very much. Appreciate those. All right. And Secretary Moore, can I ask you to introduce yes. yourself? Thank you. Uh, I am also going to share just a few slides and hopefully help um, take Leslie Ann's uh, information down and get it a little bit more Vermont specific. 
Um, so just starting by acknowledging that Vermont's environment is really climate sensitive and we know it's getting warmer and wetter. Rainfall here has increased by nearly six inches in the last 60 years on an annual basis. The number of intense rain events where we get more than an inch in a storm has also increased. Um, and Lake Champlain no longer freezes over uh, most years. In addition, our economy is pretty climate sensitive. The types of food we produce here really benefit from cooler temperatures, including dairy and maple sugar. Uh, forest products and the trees that comprise our forests are sensitive to temperature changes, as is a lot of our tourism and outdoor recreation from skiing uh, to leaf peeping to camping and mountain biking. Um, flipping back to that, that weather statistic, we are seeing larger and more frequent floods. Um, they touch small parts of Vermont every year and some years as in during Tropical Storm Irene, there's nearly a statewide effect. Um, but that we know that over the last 50 years, Vermont has uh, suffered more than 30 regional scale disastrous floods. And we also know climate change action is hard, it's sort of the ultimate tragedy of the commons, uh, where individual uses of fossil fuels are essentially uh, lost in, in the noise of a global system. Um, but at the same time, it requires every one of us to act individually to have the aggregate impact. Um, sometimes it can be hard to, to convince people that something like two degrees Celsius uh, really is a, a threat to our lives and livelihoods. Um, and it really requires a lot of changes in individual behavior. Um, and I'm going to talk just briefly about the role government can play in helping affect some of those changes, um, but it's a, it's a challenging space. So the Global Warming Solutions Act was a response to a lot of those concerns. It was passed in September of 2020. It created the Climate Council uh, that Leslie Ann and I both serve on, at, which met for the first time in November of 2020. Um, and we produced a climate action plan that was adopted just barely a year later. So a really intense undertaking and schedule. Uh, the climate plan uh, seeks to achieve a number of objectives that were identified in the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, most notably to, to cut pollution levels by about 40% from 1990 levels by 2030, um, which is also roughly half of 2005 levels. Uh, we had five subcommittees that contributed substantially to the work. Um, there was a great emphasis placed on just a just transition and prioritizing those who are most affected. And the plan itself will be updated uh, at least once every four years. And we are currently in the process of developing a framework for how we will measure progress towards these goals. The Climate Action Plan itself is organized into five impact areas. So it includes looking at greenhouse gas emissions or carbon climate pollution and how to reduce them, um, investments in resilient and working natural lands, um, protecting people in communities, capturing carbon or sequestration as it's sometimes called. And then the council also identified a number of cross-cutting solutions uh, that touch on one or more of these other impact areas. And we do have our work cut out for us. Uh, the left half of this graph where it's shown in the darker colors is, is where we've been. And on the right half, it's where we need to go. And you can see it requires really significant reductions, particularly in greenhouse gas emissions associated with transportation and thermal, which and thermal means how we heat our homes. Um, at the same time, uh, we are in a point of seeing unprecedented federal funding. And in fact, the state's FY23 budget, which runs from July 1st of this year through June 30th of calendar year 23, includes more than $200 million worth of climate investments. Uh, we established a climate action office at ANR. Um, ARPA or the American Rescue Plan Act includes um, opportunities to invest in climate mitigation. Um, and there's $128 million worth of the, such investments in this year's budget, including an unprecedented $80 million investment in weatherization. Um, and then there are also some strategic investments of one-time state general fund monies um, in a municipal fuel switching program, um, some FEMA match to help us draw down federal dollars and Im improve uh, resiliency and address flood hazards, as well as work to build out electric vehicle charging infrastructure and provide incentives 
uh, for the purchase of those vehicles. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen um, and turn it back over to Peter. Great, thank you very much, Julie. And Jared, floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Peter. Um, and thank you everyone for joining tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, bring some health considerations into the conversation tonight, um, as was already alluded to by the other panelists. Um, there are sort of two main um, areas that I, I wanna touch on tonight. One is just the acknowledgement of climate change impacts on, on health. Um, that was one of the boxes that Leslie and showed earlier. Um, we, we have you know, pretty good evidence at this point um, that Vermont, like many places around the world, are already experiencing health impacts um, associated with climate change. And uh, we do expect those impacts to just in increase over time. And some of those are, are pretty direct and a little easier to quantify, like uh, increasing numbers of heat waves. Um, an event like Tropical Storm Irene um, was very much fueled by, by climate change. Um, so that's those are some of the impacts we look at. We also um, try to focus on some other more indirect impacts that um, are a result of environmental changes. Um, for example, changes in, uh, in environmental conditions in Vermont that make our, our state more suitable for ticks um, or changes to our um, conditions in our water bodies that uh, are, are conducive to uh, to cyanobacteria blooms. So there are a lot of different ways, um, pathways that climate change can affect health. I can go into more detail on, on those. Um, one I wanted to call specific attention to is just some of the, the psychological impacts of climate change, which I don't think get a lot of attention. Um, it, just the, the fact that climate change is is, is a, a thing that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis causes you know stress and, and despair. It's an, it's an overwhelming topic for, for us to address. Um, so even if you're not you know suffering a heat illness or, or affected by uh, tick-borne disease, I think we're all bearing um, some, some mental stress associated with um, the existen existential crisis of climate change. Um, and in, in other ways in, in our daily lives, uh, we can be affected from, um, I, I hear from people that are, um, have given up hiking in the woods because they're afraid of encountering ticks and, and acquiring a tick-borne disease or folks that have spent a lifetime uh, enjoying Lake Champlain and, um, and now when they go to the shore and see cyanobacteria blooms uh, and the smell in the summer, um, that can cause a lot of sadness and, and again, kind of despair for, for folks. So um, there are a number of different ways that health is affected. Um, I hope that's a motivating factor for taking action. There's a lot we can do to help minimize those risks, um, but I don't wanna um, dwell too much on the, on the doom and gloom. I think the more exciting part of the conversation that I, I want to um, engage on tonight is that climate change actually provides a pretty substantial health opportunity in that many actions that we need to take to address climate change have positive health benefits associated with them from weatherizing our homes and installing heat pumps to, to be you know, more energy efficient in our homes can lead to improvements in our indoor air quality and reduce moisture and, and mold. Um, and just provide a much healthier indoor environment. Um, there are transportation strategies like walking and biking that are clearly wonderful for uh, reducing admissions um, and we all need more physical activity. Um, and planting trees are, are another, um, another strategy for sequestering carbon, which provide a, a variety of health benefits from shade to, to air filtration um, to water filtration. So. Um, there are a lot of exciting ways that we can we can actually improve all of our um, lives and, and health um, through climate actions, and um, that's an area that I think d deserves more more attention in this conversation as we make difficult decisions and and um, and decide you know what investments we need to make um, that it. It's not all all sacrifice. Um, there's there's some really self-serving things that we can do. 
uh, to benefit our, our, our lives um, by taking action on climate change. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Jared. Thank you to the other panelists. Uh, all right, Leslie, and I'm gonna start with a question for you. Many Vermonters are thinking about what climate change will mean for their lives. What will it look like on the ground? Will it look like longer or shorter mud seasons? Will it impact the maple sugaring season as, as Julie mentioned, will it, you know, what, what, what are some things that we think, you know, obviously we're, we're, we don't know the ways in which the systems are going to fully interact at this point. But what, it, as you as you put together the National Climate Climate Assessment in the Northeast chapter, what did you see in there that surprised you that that you you want all Vermonters to know about as we as we look to a future in which the climate is going to change, whether we uh, continue to change, whether we take action now to mitigate emissions or not. So. Thanks for those questions, um, Pete, Peter. That there was a lot of stuff packed into there, and of, of course, um, trying to unpack it will take a while. But I think some of the pieces, or, or at least one word that I think is is important, is um, flexibility, because where we are geographically means that we're getting a lot of stuff coming at us, and the the way in which climate change is playing out for us is in terms of variability and variations and this sort of going from one extreme to the next, whether it is a flood to a drought, which can occur within like two weeks, for example. And the other piece in, in all of these rapid changes is um, the nuance in there. So when we think about increasing temperatures, increasing precipitation, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna get these back, back and forth fluctuations as that occurs. And so as we're thinking about strategies to put in place to, to combat, you know, two, two inches more precipitation in the next 30 years, for example, um, not losing sight of the fact that there are droughts that we're still battling and that the nature of some of these hazards is actually changing. So we, we can't only think that everything's all settled because as more and more data come in, as we learn more and more about how things are changing, as our models get better, we need to be able to be flexible enough to, to tweak our policies to match the way that science is, is improving with time. And I mean, we do that every time we go to the doctor, right? And you know, the doctor says you have X chance of developing Y unless you do Z, right? And we, we work with that. And I think we have to bring some of that thinking and some of that flexibility into our, our moving forward in terms of, of our changing climate. So um, this year is a classic example, right? Last week, we were having this wonderfully warm fall. And then today we have icing conditions and three to six inches of snow. And that's that sort of variability and flexibility that I think we have to um, come back to, to understanding is another way in which we're seeing climate change sort of play out for us. And thinking about that and, and making sure that we're not applying a one size fits all, especially in terms of water resources, because um, that's not going to get us um, to where we need to be. Each region of the state is a little bit different. And so some of the techniques and, and approaches that we have need to match where we are in the state itself. Thank you very much. All right, Julie, here's a question for you. Um, and along a similar vein, a &R does a bunch of uh, good research into exploring the impact of changing conditions on Vermont's forests and wildlife and other uh, attributes of our natural resources. What, what are some of the highlights that you're seeing in the work that, that the team is doing um, and, and what does that, do you see that meaning for the folks on this call? Sure. Um, so maybe starting, starting with forests, I think thinking about our forest composition um, and the changes that will occur as a result of changes in temperature. For example, one in four trees in the Vermont woods is a, a maple tree. Uh, that's clearly a huge component of what gives us such brilliant falls, um, but it's also a species that'll be challenged by climate change. Um, coupled with some of the invasive species pressure that we are facing, particularly invasive insects, 
um, that maybe find uh, warmer Vermont more hospitable from um, the recent arrival of the emerald ash borer, but also things like Asian longhorn beetle and the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, our forest is facing myriad challenges associated with, or perhaps maybe better to say exacerbated by a warming and changing climate. Um, there are also a number of, of sort of our keystone wildlife species, or, or at least fan favorites, particularly moose, um, that are, are also um, exemplify some of the impacts we're seeing associated with climate change. We're, we're at the very southern edge of moose um, range, and between the changing temperatures and the explosion of winter ticks, uh, likely um, at least helped along by milder winters, uh, we're seeing our, our moose populations drop dramatically over the last 20 years. Um, and it's unclear if Vermont will be able to sustain uh, a sizable moose population into the future. And then on the, the sort of the water side of things, um, certainly the, the concerns Leslie Ann spoke to, um, both in terms of our, our drinking water and groundwater protection program, um, and the increasing number of calls we're receiving from Vermonters whose wells run dry um, through our stormwater management program and thinking about how we design best management practices that can handle more frequent and intense storms. Um, there, there is a whole range of, of conditions um, that we are learning how to design for and design around. And a big part of that challenge on the infrastructure end is generally when we're, we're thinking about infrastructure, we're thinking with a 25 to 50 year planning horizon. Um, and so being able to, to anticipate um, not only what we need for today's climate, but what we will need for future climate um, is an, an increasing challenge to our work. Thank you for that. Uh, Jared, question. I really appreciated what you said about the sort of health opportunities uh, in your opening remarks. Uh, one of those that I think about a lot is weatherization, which as a climate action uh, doesn't have a tremendous greenhouse gas benefit by itself, but it has, but it can be tied to other things and it does have a tremendous health benefit. Are there, th are there, other things like weatherization that you see as opportunities? And do you see other ways for us to think about sort of capturing the overall value from a health perspective of something like weatherization? Yeah, good questions. Um, I think after weatherization, the one I would probably focus most on would be transportation strategies. Um, there are a lot of different ways that transportation strategies provide health benefits that I, we can we can quantify um, and hopefully add into any any accounting of you know cost and benefits for these different strategies. Um, so for for the transportation area, um, as I mentioned before, you know anyone that can replace car trips with walking and biking, that actually comes with a a, a really large um, health benefit that um, that shows up in reduced healthcare utilization and a lot of dollars saved um, that we currently spend to address chronic diseases that often are, are preventable um, in different ways by addressing diet, physical activity, smoking, for example. So, you know, if we can address the physical activity piece to some extent through um, encouraging changes in transportation behavior, whether that's by uh, by building, you know, more safer, more comfortable walking and biking facilities, um, changing land use patterns to make it more feasible to live and, and work and, and shop in, in close proximity. Um, for example, you know, those are ways that, um, that uh, transportation strategies can help support that's those sort of behavior shifts. Even something like, um, using the bus um, often comes with walking on one end or the other. So lots of transportation strategies are associated with, with health benefits. Um, we have done some analysis um, in, in years past to, to demonstrate um, some of those benefits. Electrical, electric vehicles certainly provide some health benefits too in terms of air quality improvements. Um, 
but but I will say from some of the analysis we've done, um, shifting shifting folks towards more physically active transportation comes with much more uh, health benefit. Um, so that's one area. I also mentioned uh, tree planting. We've done some work on um, demonstrating how uh, planting more shade trees in urban areas helps reduce risk for, for heat illnesses. Um, and with all the, all the other environmental benefits they provide um, in terms of you know, air and, and water filtration, there are more quantifiable health benefits there. Um, so, so I think um, there are a long list of strategies that we can tie to health benefits. We can quantify those benefits. Um, I, I personally would love to see um, more consideration of, of those in cost benefit analyses. It's something that we've been kind of pushing for over the last several years, um, just to, to uh, try to capture um, some of the, the less direct benefits associated with these strategies. Great. Thank you, Jared. I'm going to ask a follow-up question, and then I'll go in reverse order this time with, with questions. Um, you talked to, you, you mentioned the idea of sort of lowering healthcare utilization, and that's a path that, that the state has explored a little bit in terms of a way to fund some of these activities. Do you see that as, a, as, a, as something that, that the state can look to for greater access to, to, to funding, or is that somewhat limited from your perspective, or what do you see as the future there? Yeah. It, and, maybe, a, and maybe explain a, a little bit more about sort of what that, what that situation looks like. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and I will say that's a, an incredibly complicated area to, to wade into. Um, but there are sort of two paths that we've seen um, some healthcare, um, either insurers or um, hospitals, healthcare providers wading into in this realm. Um, one is um, just acknowledging that the healthcare sector contributes something like five to 10% of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. It's a substantial component. So there's a pretty big focus in the healthcare arena on reducing those greenhouse gas emissions. Some of that you can do on site um, through energy systems and you know, changes at the facility, but, um, but likely not all of that. So a lot of healthcare uh, organizations are, are focusing on carbon offsets and ways that they can um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions offsite. So that's one opportunity. Um, where to offset some of um, healthcare's emissions. Um, there are some examples of um, hospital, hospitals, for example, that are investing in, um, in mitigation activities that benefit the community um, that they can essentially use to offset some of their, their emissions. Um, so that's sort of one realm. Um, and the other is there, there are some partnerships in these different topics that I talked about. There have been some projects over the years of, um, of healthcare uh, payers um, spending money on home weatherization for, um, for example, Medicaid patients with asthma, um, knowing that that investment in weatherization and often some add-on services, um, other changes to the home to reduce asthma triggers can help keep people out of the ER. Um, so I, I think I can say, at least nationally, it's an opportunity area that we continue to have conversations about. Um, making those investments in, in Vermont is complicated at levels um, well above uh, myself to, to speak to on, in this conversation. Um, so just to say that it's something that we're pursuing, that we're encouraging. We know that there are partners that are, that are interested um, but there are a lot of complicating factors in the healthcare world. And, and certainly competing demands at this time, for sure. So thank you for that. Uh, Julie, question for you. Um, congratulations on getting resources to stand, a climate, stand up a climate office in ANR. I think that's very exciting and the state should be excited about the ability to track and maintain that information and understand where it's going. It's a key piece of it. Question for you is what what is the team as it thinks about how to build the tracking tools and, and monitoring tools? What's, what's the, been the hardest kind of nut to crack as you think about that work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
So the, the best data we have available to us um, oftentimes is, is regional in scale. And it relies also on a lot of fuel sales data as a surrogate for greenhouse gas emissions. And those two pieces come with quite a bit of uncertainty. Um, and in particularly when we're talking about some of the regional data sets, there I wouldn't describe them as timely. You know, it, it can take the, there can be a delay of, of months, if not years, in receiving that sort of final data set. Um, and recognizing that this work will will move slowly and this is a really complex system at the same time. Um, we're somewhat limited by the quality of, of the current information. And so there's, there's sort of two pieces um, underway in parallel. One is, is figuring out what the system is, what the tool is we'll build to, to track that data. And then the second one is looking at if there are actually ways uh, that we can set about to improve the quality of the information we're, we're receiving um, and the timeliness of it. And so we have contractors uh, working in those spaces um, and look forward to sort of their, their recommendations and next steps. The other piece, of course, is all of our data history is based on these existing inventory and modeling tools. And so um, since all of our targets that are established in the Global Warming Solutions Act that sort of take their cues from uh, the work of the IPCC are established in percent reductions versus a baseline, there's also a question if we, we, can, we can effectively backcast uh, for data that, that we simply haven't, haven't collected. Um, that said, the ultimate goal in all of this is pretty clear, which is decarbonization. Um, and so as we move as we move closer and closer to that 2050 goal of decarbonization, um, in some ways, those comparisons to past performance will be less important, um, but they are really a, a necessary data point um, in these early days of, of climate action and carbon reduction. Thank you very much. Leslie Ann, um, you have gotten to work with colleagues from around the country or, and state climatologists from around the country in, in doing the national climate assessment. Uh, you have a relatively uh, open audience in the state of Vermont for people who are, are care about climate change, want to address it, want to understand what the issues are. Many of your colleagues probably face somewhat different audiences in their states. Have you learned any lessons about communicating uh, the impacts of climate change from, from your partners in this work that you'd want to share with this audience? So I think um, not so much in, in that space, I think in, in, in other spaces and maybe my own personal um, interactions across the state. And I think um, it sort of comes back to that need to do a, a deep listening whenever we're, we're, we're chatting with folks and to really sort of um, understand where everybody's coming from and to really try to meet folks where they are so that you have a, a conversation and not um, um, a, a battle, right? And so to the extent that um, it's the same way that I approach my classes, right? Try, trying to understand where my students are coming from, trying to do what's called um, social constructiveness, which is, you know, find something that is already um, part of something that somebody knows and then use that to actually start the conversation. And so I think for me, it's been a reinforcing of, of that principle, of that way of, of carrying on business or trying to answer questions. And, and I think to the extent that, you know, a lot of, of my fellow state climatologists operate in similar ways because we're all interested in science and in the service of society. Um, it's, it's always about listening first and then saying, how can we help? Great, great answer. Uh, I'm gonna go to a couple of the questions in the chat uh, and then we can get back to some of the moderator driven questions. So the first question comes from Steve Gold. Vermont's population is very likely to grow significantly due to the arrival of thousands of climate refugees. This will negatively impact the state's ability to achieve the climate goals the plan is set. Uh, can, can the panel react to that? Happy to start. Um, yeah, I, I think thinking about climate refugees and just people moving to Vermont in general um, is, is a real challenge. And part of that 
is trying to ensure we have the infrastructure in place, in particular drinking water and wastewater infrastructure to support the kind of compact settlement patterns that are gonna be essential to minimizing those, those effects. Um, this ties into a lot of some of the, the health considerations Jared spoke to too, in terms of having kind of vibrant walkable communities that are less dependent on cars to get to the, the goods and services people need. Um, but Vermont doesn't, doesn't have the kind of wastewater and drinking water infrastructure that many other states do. Um, we have 200 villages and, and downtown centers throughout the state. So there's more of those than, than towns necessarily, but um, that, that don't, don't currently have community scale drinking water and wastewater systems. And I think being really thoughtful about how we develop, um, understanding that, that people are going to want to live here uh, is going to be a really important piece of, of managing um, the impact uh, that would otherwise be had on the state's ability to meet these climate goals. The, the other thing um, to layer on what Julie just, just talked about is um, the potential for having increased vulnerability from a social perspective, from a people's perspective, because as, as new folks arrive into the state, um, we, we have to appreciate um, where folks are coming from and the fact that uh, we have um, new cultural differences, cultural um, pieces that are now going to be at the table, similarly with linguistic and language elements. And so as we uh, prepare for and try to, again, meet folks where they are, um, being able to receive information in the language that's your majority language is, is non-trivial. And so as, as we, we broaden some of our thinking um, in how to be welcoming, um, it's all of these various pieces and all of the the profit and not for profit agencies that are already working in in these spaces who can serve as as trusted um, partners in, in helping to move forward and to actually help to prepare to welcome folks to the state. I just add to that piece those two answers that the the key consideration in Vermont's climate goals or they are Vermont's part in the contribution to globally fighting climate change. So in concept, if we are successful across the globe in mitigating the impacts of, uh, you know, in, in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, then where on arbitrary borders, you know, on either side of arbitrary borders, people live should not have the impact because the globe doesn't care whether Vermont is an island or it's part of a global system. Those emissions are happening you know, all over the place and they contribute everywhere. So there is a, there's a sort of inherent recognition within these goals that, that, that we can't do it alone, that we have to do it in part and parcel with our national, other state, other country partners around the world to be able to make this work. Um, but we can't not do our part because it's it's part of leading, right? It's part of leading and being a good steward is fighting that tragedy of the commons picture that Julie mentioned. I I might just add um, to to build on all of that um, somewhat somewhat facetiously. I think we try to do things um, better in Vermont than in. Uh, most other states, and if we do a better job of addressing climate change in Vermont than some of our neighboring states or other states in the country, then it's almost a, a benefit from that global perspective. The more folks we bring here, the more we bring into the fold of the effective ways that we're addressing climate change in Vermont, and somewhat less facetiously, um, if some of those challenges that that the other panelists brought up can be managed effectively. It, it can also be a positive to have more critical mass here to support um, efficient infrastructure, um, whether that's transit systems or um, urban design that, that Julie mentioned. Um, so while recognizing that there are a lot of challenges with bringing in an influx of, of people from, from other places and, um, and integrating uh, everyone into a a collaborative environment here, um, it does present a lot of uh, additional opportunity. Great. 
Uh, following up on that a, a bit, uh, Jeff Farber asked the question, are all forecasting based upon the current and expanding standard of living and consumer pattern supporting a hyper GDP growth focused economy that has already overshot the Earth's regenerative capacity? Or is there discussion about a, what a realistic sustainable standard of living that is far less dependent on industrial and equity fossil fueled corporate model might look like and the sacrifices that Vermonters and all first world citizens might need to face? I mean, I'm happy to start um, again there. I, I, I think that that's sort of beyond where we went with the, the climate action plan and thinking about kind of the, the carrying capacity of the land. Um, it's, it's essentially, well, first of all, Vermont focused um, and so doesn't, doesn't consider some of these larger um, global or international scale issues. Um, there was some talk about consumption. Uh, I wouldn't say it was the, the focus of the plan. Um, the plan was, was largely focused on, on voluntary um, or incentive-based programs to help uh, accelerate the transition to beneficial electrification, uh, but certainly reducing consumption is going to be part of the overall uh, path to success. Uh, there is work going on looking at life cycle carbon analyses, um, so sort of cradle to grave um, on a, a range of different technologies in the, the energy generation space in particular. And I do think some of that life cycle carbon analysis, while not directly uh, reducing consumption, is thinking about sort of the overall least impact way. Um, that we can can go about uh, getting to a, a cleaner and carbon free space. The question was also raised um, back in August. I was part of um, ISQUALS, which is the International Quality of Life Studies uh, group, which brings together folks from all over the, the planet in, in thinking about health, well-being, and, and ways to improve our standard and, and quality of life. And, and that was a question that was actually posed at the end of, of uh, the keynote. And I think part of the challenge with moving forward with um, addressing that is making sure that all folks are at the table. Because if we don't have everybody from every socioeconomic group, then um, the way that we come up with an answer to that question might be a little bit different too. All right. Uh, Peg asked me a question directly that I will answer. She said, what's happening on the energy side? What's the state's energy efficiency utility thinking about relative to reducing demand on the thermal side? What's happening to decentralized electric supply via microgrids and promoting individual and community self-sufficiency? There's a lot there. Um, there's a lot happening on the electricity side. We have one of the things that we have succeeded in doing in this state in better than others is to uh, be working on cleaning our electric grid uh, faster than most. Whereas 70, about 70% 70, 70 or so of our emissions come from transportation and thermal. Right now that number is around 2% from our electricity sector. There are, there are conversations about how you measure those and that those emissions and where they come from to Julie's life cycle accounting point. But we have, uh, we buy a, a lot of uh, hydro-Quebec power that is uh, clean. We have a, a growing um, solar and wind opportunities in Vermont. We have a lot of small scale hydro that was, has been pre-existing. Um, and, and so we have done a lot as a state to reduce the overall emissions of our electricity grid. However, there are always opportunities to use less electricity along the way. And we, as the, the state's energy efficiency utility are really thinking about how do, we, how do we take that to the next level of thinking about how do we reduce our overall greenhouse gas emissions as we also pursue energy savings projects. That's really becoming really interesting in say the uh, refrigeration space. Um, we, you know, you think about all the small grocery stores around Vermont, um, many of them have older systems that may leak. The uh, refrigerants that are in those systems have very, very high global warming potential numbers, which means relative to carbon dioxide, they are X 
thousands more potent, times more potent in terms of warming uh, the planet than carbon dioxide. Are. So if we can work to help uh, a local business save money along the way because they're having to replenish their refrigeration system more less and to help you know reduce the the hfcs and other things that are going out in the atmosphere that is a very positive thing and lots of mutual benefit so we all need to be thinking about sort of in the way in which we organize the existing programs we have how do we build towards that low uh carbon future we're looking for and then on on the sort of uh, supply side of microgrid, we're continuously, the United States continuously working for more distributed generation. The idea of these microgrids with big battery storage opportunities and other things that can support and sustain uh, a town. So you don't have a town like Rochester that was completely sort of cut off from the rest of the world during Irene um, and can maintain power through that and the things like that. There's a lot of work there that continues to need to be, need to be done, but the electric utilities in Vermont are really hyper-focused on creating those opportunities to create resilience um, in this. And I think, it, you know, as a data point today, which, you know, we had heavy, wet snow after, you know, a lot of uh, warm weather. And I think there were only something like 268 outages in all of Green Mountain Power's territory, which covers 83% of the state. Um, I only know that because a colleague happened to be one of those 200 and whatever. And um, that gets to a question below in the chat around what do we do now that we're electrifying everything? What do we do if they're power edges? How do we think about that as an emergency management factor? We are going to, you know, the, the beautiful thing is that we have one of the most sort of progressive emergency management offices in the country that have really integrated climate adaptation and what that looks like into the um, into the planning process in a really meaningful way. Um, for, for my house, I think about the fact that even if, you know, I'm not running uh, heat pumps or whatever else, my, you know, my fuel oil furnace is triggered by electricity. So if there's no power, I have no heat. You know, the, the pellet stove doesn't light because it's triggered by electricity, right? Those, these are situations that we're going to increasingly have to deal with. There's a lot of storage, you know, battery storage and other opportunities along the way that can help with that. But it's going to be a challenge kind of across the society as we think about how to maintain the lives that we've become accustomed to and our health and safety along the way. So uh, lots of good questions. Uh, um, Ned Swanberg had a question in chat that might be mostly, uh, Julia, I might look to your help for this one. Is there adequate mutual support among state agencies uh, toward implementing the cap? Is And is Vermont considering the urgency and implications of global impacts and global equity, such as the need to sustainably build local food production, processing, storage, and security? So um, in answer to the, the first question, one of the things um, that we are in the process of standing up as part of creating the Climate Action Office is an interagency um, working group that brings in all of the relevant agencies. So includes Vermont Emergency Management, Vermont Department of Health, uh, Department of Public Service, the Agency of Transportation, um, and six or seven others uh, together to, to make sure that, that we are aware of the, the programs and opportunities within each other's space. Uh, there are a lot of programs in, these, in our agencies of state government that were put in place for reasons other than uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions or supporting uh, resilience and adaptation, but have those effects nonetheless and trying to, to make sure we have um, sort of a comprehensive accounting and an ability to frankly tweak and adjust those programs to maximize their climate impacts is really important going forward. We've had the initial meeting of that advisory group um, and anticipate that they will likely have to meet quarterly, if not more regularly going forward, um, particularly as we're building this measuring and assessing progress tool uh, so that we have full information based on the, all the work of state government. In terms of, of looking at some of the, the flu, food supply issues, um, I'd actually broaden it to, to be a, a really uh, thoughtful conversation around the importance of our natural and working lands, 
um, both from a, a food production perspective, but also sort of a, a landscape level resilience perspective. And this is an area where the, the Climate Council did spend a considerable amount of time. One of the council's five subcommittees focused on agriculture and, and ecosystem protection. Um, and this work was, was discussed regularly. And there are, there are specific acknowledgements, um, strategies, and frankly, investments called for in um, sort of core, core components of, of what it takes to grow food locally um, and see it distributed in a way that is equitable. Great. Thank you, Julie. Do any other panelists want to add to that? Um, this is a question from Andrea, uh, on point on NPR reported a few weeks ago that the pressure of wealthy climate refugees is leading to 14,000 per acre acres per year in Vermont being approved for development. This pattern will make rural sprawl worse. What can be done to make sure that the village centers get the population and not the hillsides? I'll jump in and then let let others help here too. Um, <laughs> that I think that is that's an enormous challenge. And one of the conversations we've been having um, in the legislature over the last couple of sessions is they they've taken up Act 250 reform and and focused um, oftentimes on on the places we don't want folks to develop. Is that that really needs to go hand in glove with creating real incentives for the places we do want folks to develop the infill and redevelopment in our downtowns and village centers. Um, it includes making strategic investments and probably my background as a civil engineer shines through but strategic investments in drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, when you are relying on septic systems and private wells, generally the minimum lot size is somewhere between a quarter and a half acre to make sure your wastewater stays far enough away from your drinking water. Um, that does not, that's not compact settlement. Um, and frankly, the, the other challenge here is oftentimes the ability to add accessory dwelling units um, to some of our existing homes is limited by the size of the septic system. Um, so it's really it's it's a uh, it's looking both at, at trying to create disincentives um, to develop in in a sprawl like fashion in places where we wish homes and businesses wouldn't go, and at the same time either removing regulatory barriers or creating outright incentives um, as well as the supporting infrastructure to bring that development sustainably into our downtowns and village centers. Yeah, I would just add to that. I'll put my former D A and R hat on the. There are a couple of ways that I see, you know, we have a ton of brownfields in the state of Vermont and we have invested a bunch of money recently and to try to transform some of those formerly contaminated sites into places that are suitable for redevelopment. These are the former industrial heart and souls of our communities that are sitting vacant, that are ready to be used, that are ready to be turned into whether it be housing, whether it be some other way to support the local community in a way that is uh, creates meaningful impact and is that infill development we need to see. And then I, I, I think we need to be honest with ourselves. Development in Vermont, most of Vermont's villages is just not possible. The, the existence of older, soon to be if not failing septic systems with no hope of being able to replace them means that there really isn't a place to develop in Vermont, many of Vermont's villages. So we need to be thinking about systems that can handle the existing footprint and the ability to expand, whether that be sort of community-based uh, septic type systems or small wastewater systems. That, that is a huge limiting factor uh, in where we can see development in Vermont. Um, and if we were to you know, if we were to push to limit to those areas that are already sewered, we wouldn't, there wouldn't be much capacity there either. So we really need to think about those new opportunities to do that, do that um, to really support that compact growth. I know we often talk about in our, in our, in our world about trying to make sure that we don't support sprawl through the extension of sewer lines and other things, but the generation of new systems that can handle 
that compact development is really critical to our ability to develop those village centers and redevelop and have them reemerge as the economic centers that they once were. And then the piece that climate change layers on top of that is um, with the unpredictability of, of drought situations and that water availability factor. That's just one added dimension in terms of, of that planning for the future and the sizing that needs to take place. And, and to your point, Leslie, and about how to make sure that we make inviting places where people want to be and where we welcome uh, and adapt to and, and accept the, the people who are coming in to live with us right there. That's a, that, that may be the number one challenge that we'll face in all of this. Um, Jeff uh, Dexter wanted to touch on something that, that Julie mentioned about the two degrees Celsius and and I thought you did a nice job, Julie, of comparing it to sort of what five degrees looked like in the previous ice age. Uh, but it's, you know, it really is a challenge for all of us in communicating uh, around climate change. The two, per, two degrees doesn't sound that bad, right? It sounds kind of nice when it's freezing outside. Um, but that's not really what we're talking about. And, and that's sort of the, the challenge in that communication. Um, and so Jeff would just like us to make sure that we reminded ourselves to to while it's an important number and it's important sort of guiding principle for lots of us, it doesn't necessarily resonate in the same way. So, uh, and then Bob Pop has a question. He says, I think we can all agree that there's a severe housing shortage and the answer is to just build more housing. There's another part of the problem that is not addressed, which is wealthy folks building second homes, either for seasonal use or short-term rental. How can we focus on providing housing to those who need it and not for investment or leisure? I'll jump in here because I was at a housing conference today, and so I'm an expert now. Um, no, Bob, that's a great, great question. The 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 bottom line is that to build to build housing that meets the affordability needs that Vermont faces is just not cost effective without a lot of uh, you know philanthropic and public support. What I just got quoted at by the the head of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board is their cost per unit is at four hundred and fifty thousand dollars at this point, whereas pre pandemic it cost two hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Still pretty high, it feels like four hundred fifty thousand dollars is not a sustainable number if we think about making that affordable. Um, and we talked a lot today about the idea of how do you address the sort of long-term energy equity concerns of underserved and low-income Vermonters. And a lot of that has to do with their housing stock and what they have available to them. We have traditionally taken models where in both the climate change and the energy efficiency space, for example, where you know, climate change doesn't matter which carbon molecules we get rid of, it's all good, right? Doesn't matter. But if we leave people behind in that conversation, then we will exacerbate all of our other public policy goals that we face, challenges that we face. And then from the energy efficiency side, it's the same thing. We have been looking to reduce electric demand for the last 20 years, and we've been really successful at that. That doesn't mean that everybody has gotten to participate in those programs on an equitable basis. And so we have a lot of work to do to recenter the way we think about success in these programs built on those core equity principles. Um, so it, it, it's not an easy answer, but we're, we're all thinking about it a lot harder than we once were. So I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in. My, I slept at a Holiday Inn Express last night answer. I think you're doing well, Peter. Thank you, Leslie Ann. Um, Andrea asks, how about tiny house villages with composting toilets and gray water recycling systems? These exist and they work. I think the answer is that that they they do. They're not something that's necessarily fully com, uh, contemplated by our existing regulatory schemes, and that's a bit of a challenge, but not an an insurmountable one. Um, we, you know, there there are obvious public health concerns about. Um, Having having sort of non traditional 
uh, wastewater disposal practices, but that is an area that we're actively um, looking at and there's a, a small working group and it's not just frankly about tiny, tiny house villages, but also looking at ways um, to support sort of off the grid, totally off the grid development um, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to traditional infrastructure. So there, there's a working group that's been formed um, within, within ANR um, and some external stakeholders and more to come in that space. Yep, and this is another example of good public policy not considering what happens down the line because that good public policy to create public drinking water supplies and public wastewater systems has been the number one public health action that has been taken over the last umpty uh, de you know centuries. That that's critical, right? And now we have to think about what comes next. Um, so. Really important. Um, Michelle asked a question. Jared, can you talk more about the psychological impact of climate change, especially for young people, and how to keep their spirits up through this work? Sure. Thank you, Michelle. Um, this is a question I find particularly concerning having a young person that um, is unaware of climate change um, at this point, but um, will absolutely be facing it. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think the two the two main the two main suggestions I would um, I would give in terms of keeping their spirits up, and it's a I'll just first say it's amazing to see the um, the 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 energy and the the power of young people in um, taking on this this global challenge um, and trying to push us to to take the action that we need to to address it and keep the planet habitable for them um but i i think i think that that's also sort of the solution is um a take action i i think there's pretty clear evidence that um one of the most effective ways to keep your spirits up when faced with a daunting challenge is to do something um even if it's a small action um doing something uh, alone um, helps helps sort of balance out some of that uh, that psychological impact and and keep keep things level for you. Um, and I will add to that and saying B, um, don't just do something, but do something with other people. Um, I think that's that's really key is that we all need support and collaborators and um, sympathizers. Um, People to fight with, people to cry with. Um, so the there's been a lot of effectiveness of of young people working in in groups, um, and that's another area I think that's getting some attention now. As uh, just having the having the social supports is being you know really critical for um, for addressing some of those negative psychological impacts. Um, so I, I don't want it, to, it's a daunting issue, um, obviously. So I, I don't want to undersell that, but um, taking action and, and taking action together um, with like-minded like folks that, uh, that want to see change, um, I think are sort of the two, the two key strategies that, that are uh, really effective. And there's so many climate alliances, youth climate alliances that have sprung up all over the country from the high school level all the way through to university level and beyond. And the, the the absolute fire and passion and commitment that you see there. You know, people ask me, how do you get up every morning? And I say, because I look at my students and they give me hope. And I think that's where a lot of this sort of lies, right? It's it's seeing that sort of like do itness in in the younger generation that really sort of energizes and gives you that next push. We see it on the climate council, like all the youth members on the climate council are like really, really gung ho. And so I think again, it's a classic example of of harnessing all that creativity and talent and and joy and hopefulness in folks coming up the line to help move some of these pieces forward. Absolutely agree. As a Dad of teenagers, I see the choices that my children make 
impacted by their education system, impacted by their what they've seen around them, they're already thinking about the ways in which they're going to mitigate their own carbon footprint, uh, do it on a regular basis, and thinking about the life choices that they want to make that have that sort of carbon friendly environment. Um, so uh, Jean-Jacques asked a question, do you see a uh, problem with the automobile switch to EV, which is quickly focusing on performance rather than energy efficiency, cost of electricity increase globally in the very near future? Uh, I'll, I'll hop in on this one. Um, I think, so there are a couple of things in the EV space that I think are really important. One for, and this is more of a car issue, we have, we have built us a society that is predicated upon the automobile. Not only that, but we have made it a symbol, status symbol. We have made it a extension of people's personality, right? In a way that it is impossible to sever that immediately. Um, it's been the number one sort of marketing success of the 20th century, I'll use success in air quotes, right? It is, it's a sex symbol. It's all those things that are really hard to extract from um, the physical attributes of an automobile. The fact that we have electric vehicles and we're starting to see more and more electric vehicles that have the capabilities that, that people are typically used to in a vehicle is really important because it helps them see themselves in those vehicles is it perfect is it them are they the most energy efficient uses no but we need also we we would that's going to be a continued evolution along the way to be able to understand how do we purchase the vehicles that we need for 95 percent of our driving trips rather than the hundred that we buy them for now right for that you know that extra storage capacity or the bigger truck or what have you that we really don't most of the time don't need. And we have a, we adapt to whatever, you know, the smaller size of the vehicle is, or we borrow or we rent or we do what we need to to fill that void. Um, the cost of electricity is going to go up. Okay, you can see that already. The retail prices in Vermont are going up. They're going up less in Vermont than elsewhere. I've seen doubling within New England of of rates that are due that are you know due to supply chain issues, the war in Ukraine, all sorts of things. Those prices are going to continue to rise, but they're nowhere near the rise the 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 price changes we've seen in the fossil fuel markets. So that continues to be, to my mind, as we think to things that are that are separate and apart from that volatile energy mix. That you know that that are subject to the the whims of Vladimir Putin or whomever, whomever, right? So that we can have those renewable energy resources and other things provide our power um, is really important. So uh, there, there, yes, the current world is increasing prices, and and the electric utilities are not immune to those increasing prices. But it is certainly less than what we've seen from the you know transportation fuels and other things over time. I, I wanted to take the moment now to uh, to invite anybody who would like to to raise your hand and come on screen and ask a question. Otherwise, I will give our panelists the opportunity to uh, to provide some closing marks, and I'll ask you a question to to lead into that. But let me first see if there are others would like to ask questions either by raising your hand or in the in the chat. And if you're like me and you can't figure out precisely what the how the reactions button works and just want to come on screen and wave, you're welcome to do that too. Uh, Jeff asks, how about pushing to lower speed limits, particularly on the interstates by 10 or 15 percent, which would immediately decrease carbon emissions from transportation by a similar percentage due to reduction in, in gas use? Do you know uh, that is it's not something that while well, I was part of the climate council that was considered, um, but not sure if that's uh, been discussed since then. Uh, it, it wasn't specifically discussed by the climate council that said uh, as part of the 
sort of poorly named Inflation Reduction Act that does include a lot of the Build Back Better programs around climate financing. Um, there is money that's been provided for the Agency of Transportation to develop a carbon reduction strategy, and I believe um, speed limits is, is one of the things they're asked to look at. It, it's a myriad of, it asks them to consider a range of policy choices um, that would use existing investments that are being made through the Federal Highway Administration in state transportation infrastructure um, to further reduce carbon emissions associated with its use. And that's, uh, I believe that that plan will be completed by the end of next calendar year. Great, thanks, Julie. All right, well, let me ask with it, unless there anybody else has another question, I'll, I'll pose this question to our panelists. Um, in thinking about Jared's answer to how do we uh, make sure that we sort of avoid the despair that can come with this existential crisis and our the challenges we face in meeting it. What is something that you are each doing to, as Jared said, taking action together? What does that look like for you and why does it bring you joy, solace in this moment? I'll start, with, we're gonna start with Jared since he prompted the discussion. Um, well, I'll try to see if I can frame something in, in the realm of my, my young person, since that was part of uh, the, the topic tonight. Um, I mean, I, I, I take a lot of joy in trying to be a good role model and set a, set a good example for, for her. And something that we've really gotten into this past year is biking. And um, right now, it's mostly sitting in the trailer. Um, and following behind, um, but that's that's going to be an ongoing focus for us is just um, integrating her into the activities that we want, which um, will hopefully help uh, reduce our impacts on climate change, whether that's um, uh, working in the garden with me, mostly just plucking off the cherry tomatoes and popping them in her mouth, um, or um, using our bikes to get around. Um, I think that's that role modeling um, climate friendly behavior is really important to me and just brings me great joy to to share that with my my little daughter. Perfect. Uh, I think we all spend too much time popping off the cherry tomatoes, so I won't I won't falter for that. Uh, Leslie Ann, same question to you. Well, I don't have that much of a green thumb, so I won't be popping that many cherry tomatoes. But anyway, um, what brings me joy is is actually talking with people, working with people, um, hearing the stories, hearing what the challenges, issues and concerns are, and then trying to do something about it. And then, like Jared, modeling it for my students and helping them to see how to learn how to walk with cultural and intellectual humility to use all of the, the knowledge, the skills, the whatever they've learned over the last X number of years in service to somebody else, because it's not for you and it's not about you. It's always to help other people. So for me, people come first and modeling that to the extent that I can, I think is, is what gives me the most joy. That's great, thank you. And Julie. I'm gonna pick up on Jared's bicycle theme. I uh, purchased an e-bike two summers ago and I grin all the time when I'm riding it. It is so, so much fun. It is not, it's kept hundreds of miles off of my car um, during the, the good weather, but it is the most enjoyable form of transportation I think I've, I've ever experienced. And just, um, I think th those kinds of innovations, right? Where it, you know, I live on top of one hill, I go down through Mount Pillar and work on top of another hill. And that was for some reason a barrier to, to riding a, a true pedal bicycle, but this e-bike changed my world. And I, I think there will be, continued um, progress and evolution and things that that make it easier uh, for folks to to have a climate friendly or climate friendlier lifestyle um, and that e-bike is near the top of my list uh, i i live along julie's commute home and i can attest to the the grin 
that I always see on her face as she flies by on her e-bike. So uh, <laughs> yes, that is wonderful. All right. Um, I think without further ado, I really appreciate the opportunity to have been here with you all tonight. And thank you to our panelists and give a virtual round of applause for them for taking their time out of their busy day, spending the evening with you all. So thank you, Leslie Ann. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Jared, for being with us. Um, to Michelle and Peg for, for hosting us. This is wonderful. It's such a wonderful opportunity to get together and have these types of community conversations, whether in person or virtual figured out how to make work. Agreed. Thank you all. This was wonderful. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And we will see you at the next one.